With the newest Victoria 3 patch, we saw a change to the previously entirely useless government-run ownership method. This was good in the sense that a useless ownership method is no fun at all, but they kind of overcompensated with Command Economy now being probably the most powerful economic model in the game. I'm going to put that aside for now, as that's not the real topic of the video. Instead, I want to talk about the mindset of ownership methods in general, and talk about private ownership. This includes the merchant guilds, privately owned, and publicly traded ownership methods, and my problems with their implementation. I'm going to refer to those three methods collectively as private ownership, simply because I don't want to repeat all three over and over again. My contention is that the actual differences between private ownership, cooperative ownership, and government ownership are smaller than they ought to be. For the time being, the difference is simply which pops get money, and that can have the knock-on effect of changing which interest groups gain clout. That is the extent of the differences between ownership methods. I want to zero in on private ownership and talk about some ideas I have for how to make private ownership a more interesting and impactful form of capital ownership. This is so important to me because Victoria 3 is inherently a game of economics, and to me the ownership of capital ought to be a central focus of the game. That being said, Victoria 3 is still a video game. I don't care to most accurately represent any economic principles, rather I care to use those principles to justify actually fun game mechanics. That means I'm going to be referencing some real-life economic ideas, but I won't necessarily follow them in an accurate way if it could make the game cumbersome. Let's talk about it. In the rising industrialization of the Victorian era, privatization of industry was revolutionary. It's a universal truth that one of the ways to escape government having control over you, at least to some extent, is to be rich. With money comes self-determination and often power. This is especially true when the government itself has novel concepts like human rights or limited democracy. In economics, spending and saving are sort of like a push and pull force that contributes to the health of an economy. When people save money, they're not using it, and that money can be considered effectively useless economically, only contributing to inflation. Whereas when money is being spent, it is creating opportunity for the creation of goods and services. This can be summarized by the fear and greed index as a simplification. When things are good, people spend. When things look grim, people save. Ignoring all the extremely important nuance for the purpose of creating a video game, one of the central driving factors for people feeling safe to spend money is the understanding that the government will not seize your property. If you're in America, Canada, or Europe, this is something you probably have never even needed to consider when it comes to spending money, and that's largely in part to the now ubiquitous property rights that we all enjoy in the stable Western world. In other parts of the world, this is not so common. Would you buy a car if you knew that it were possible it could be seized at a moment's notice with no recourse? You might still do it if you perhaps felt like you could defend your property yourself, or you were a bit of a risk taker, but many people would instead choose to not if they felt they couldn't guarantee the safety of that property. In Victoria 3, property rights basically don't exist, but nor do violations of property rights outside of two cases. There's sort of representation for property rights in the difference between laissez-faire and interventionist economic policies. With laissez-faire, the player cannot close down privately owned businesses, and in return, capitalists invest more into the investment pool. This is equivalent to property rights being more strongly protected and in return the will of capitalists to invest in businesses increasing. On the other hand, the command economy policy immediately seizes all private property for the state and cooperative ownership immediately seizes it for the workers. Both of these policies cut the investment pool significantly, with command economy entirely seizing it and cooperative ownership cutting it to only 30%, down from 50 or 75% for interventionism and laissez-faire respectively. So what's the problem then? It seems like these concepts of private property are represented. The problem is that it's an all-or-nothing system. Even in real life Victorian England, there was at least one historical case of a cooperatively owned business, and I can only imagine that there were a couple more that maybe just weren't as famous. In England, there were even crown corporations which are effectively government-run enterprises, while still being a capitalist economic model. The only thing that can be state-run in Victoria 3 without changing to a complete command economy are railways, which is funny considering historically, railways are one of the first examples of the power of private investment by many shareholders. Let me tie this back into my previous point about fear and greed. To me, the whole idea of an economic policy law is kind of ridiculous. I think that instead, the level of laissez-faire economics versus government-run or cooperatively owned economics ought to be measured by the percentage of enterprises that are owned privately, nationally, or collectively. This sort of triangle of possible ownership models would make a lot more sense for creating the conditions under which capitalists would choose to invest or not to invest. If it looks like the British government is beginning to nationalize a lot of industries, then ought it not be the case that the capitalists will feel some fear around making new businesses? If a ton of previously nationalized businesses were suddenly sold off to capitalists at auction for cheap, or perhaps even handed out in an effort to privatize, would that not create a surge of capital investment? 
For that reason, I'd like to see the whole economic system law removed from the game and ownership methods instead be entirely in the player's hands, but with consequences for those decisions. For example, if I nationalize a bunch of privately owned businesses, it should make the industrialists lose approval based on how much of the GDP those businesses compose. If I nationalize some privately owned arms industry that accounted for something like half a percent of the GDP, I think industrialists won't make that big of a stink. But if I did the same to my textiles, which may compose a third of my GDP, they're not going to just take that. It's simple because the interest group system already has an approval number which can be integrated into a nationalization and collectivization. I do think though that you should have to research certain society technologies to unlock government run and cooperatively owned methods. It wouldn't make sense for 1836 Britain to just collectivize everything before socialist thought had entered the marketplace of ideas. You might even want to set artificial caps on how much the country can be of a particular ownership method based on laws. For example, I doubt you could reasonably expect a 100% nationalized economic model, a la command economy, if you have universal suffrage and guaranteed liberties. It just wouldn't really make any sense. Basically, the nation's laws ought to contribute to the maximal amounts of any given ownership method allowed in the country. This system would allow for more creativity within the game around choices of economic model, and a more nuanced system mechanically for where you draw the line of private, national, and cooperative ownership. To give an example of that nuance, I'm going to construct a hypothetical game of Victoria 3 where I'm the UK and I've conquered Egypt. I'm running a pretty much laissez-faire economic model. Something like 80% of my GDP comes from private industry, and the remaining 20% is government-run stuff like weapons, food, electricity, and railways, let's say. I've taken Egypt, and they are horrifically radical. I want to fix that problem. I can use my authority to put decrees down and violently suppress them, as in the current game. I can try to produce goods that they consume in Egypt and reduce the cost of living there, as also in the game. What if I choose to collectivize all the businesses there using my new idea about ownership? That would take all the businesses in Egypt and let the workers there run things and pay out huge profits to them, making them happy. This would of course shift the balance of ownership in my nation significantly. Let's say all the businesses in Egypt compose something like 15% of my GDP. If I were to collectivize 15% of the nation's GDP, that would make the capitalists a bit fearful of future collectivization, reducing the investment pool. But now the Egyptians may become loyal. See, that's an interesting idea. It doesn't have much historical precedent given that collectivization was often put down wherever possible, but this is a game. I'm willing to forego some historical realities to create interesting interaction between private ownership and collective ownership. I like to call this balance something simple, like ownership share or something. I don't know, I suck at naming things, look at my channel name. The arbitrary caps on amount of stuff that can be nationalized or collectivized should be different based on the nation's laws and tech that you've researched. That to me would be the balancing mechanism. Obviously with how government run ownership is balanced currently, being able to nationalize huge swaths of land would be extremely broken. Maybe limit it heavily until you unlock central planning, or make it so only autocracies can do a lot of it. I think monarchies should have the highest ability to nationalize businesses, followed by theocracy, council republic, presidential republic, and then parliamentary republic. But you know, balancing is something that comes with experience. I'm not sure how to balance perfectly without some ability to implement the changes and see how it goes. That's the first change to private ownership I want to see. This change would radically alter the relationship between state and private ownership, as well as breathing in life to the actual decision making of the economic meta of the game. Adding this one layer to the game will create whole new playstyles. I'm not done yet though, because private ownership has even more changes outside of its interaction with other forms of ownership. Let's talk about that next. Capitalism is competitive. This is perhaps one of the most emblematic statements of capitalism out there. Capitalist entities compete for market share by using innovation, gatekeeping, and aggressive monopolistic business decisions to ensure they hold as much market share as possible, with the tantalizing golden apple of a complete monopoly at the end of the tunnel. In Victoria 3, every capitalist plays nicely with everyone in their own market, which makes no sense at all. I want you to consider a situation where there's a size 50 textile mill in London. It's the only textile mill in England, let's say. Suddenly, the government invests its budget into building another size 50 textile mill over in Yorkshire. You'd think the London textile mill would be concerned over its new competition, which has been created at the behest of the state. You might even think the capitalists in London would lobby the government to change their mind, maybe. There are all kinds of really granular things the game could do to simulate the competitive nature of capitalism, but let me sort of ground everything in actual mechanics, so this doesn't sound like some mad raving. Let's talk about the inherent motivation of capitalists to reach monopolies, the ultimate end goal of all competition. It would be absurd for every business to have their interests represented, since economies like Britain's often have a huge number of businesses across their empire, Instead, I want to borrow from CK3, the largest five businesses, as measured by the share of GDP, are powerful businesses. Each of these five businesses will have a sort of head capitalist as a character who represents the interests of the business. That interest is in the form of lobbying in return for something. Consider the London textile mill from before. A particularly confident capitalist leader might threaten the government over the issue of constructing competition or even ask that other textile imports be ended to drive prices up for their profits. 
I'd like an interface with the requests, demands, and incentives of the London Textile Mill. Requests are things the business wants in return for an incentive. For example, the London Mill might request that the mills in York should be removed, and in return they'll deposit half their cash reserves into the government treasury. Consider this akin to lobbying. Would that be balanced? I'm not sure, but it's easy to balance by just changing the amount of cash reserve to deposit. You might think that this means the state should always want monopolies then, but then we get to demands. A demand is something a business holds over the state, not in return for something, but in order to prevent a consequence. Let's have another scenario where the textile mill says to the government, end American clothes imports, or else we will start treating American traders with perhaps some hostility. It's a veiled threat about essentially harassing or even attacking American traders. Consider it a form of protectionism. The capitalists definitely are aware of the thematic issue that this could cause, and indeed that's their intention. If American traders are not treated well in Britain, that could harm greater political relations between Britain and America, or even end trade routes between the two external to the clothes industry due to the perception of Britain as an unfriendly trading partner. Other threats might include temporary underproduction of necessary goods, or the ending of sales in certain states. This would cut into the textile industry's profits perhaps, but they're thinking long term, as any good capitalist ought to. The ideas for what actual threats could exist are nearly endless, but you can honestly just look to real history to find examples and approximate them in-game, or go your own way entirely and create all sorts of wacky but historically grounded scenarios. To me it would be kind of important to keep things somewhat grounded, but I don't know, it could also be fun to imagine a textile mill stockpiling weaponry and declaring independence as a microstate or something. You might say Britain could just nationalize the textile mill in response to those threats, and they could, but then they risk upsetting the industrious interest group, who won't like nationalization, and they lose out on potential investments and lobbying from that business. In order to not make nationalization pretty much always the answer, it would be important to have the incentives provided by requests actually be meaningful. With that in mind, simple things like treasury deposits and cash reserves are nice, but I'd like to imagine more creative incentives. How about the textile mill does a right to work campaign and intentionally raises wages for non-union workers in return for the government promising to build up 20 new cotton plantations within three years? The point of this is to weaken the trade unions, who might be agitating for collectivization in the country at the time. How about the mills ask that a once private cotton plantation be seized nationally and then cut a deal where the national plantation can only sell to the London mill in return for a price hike on cotton purchased from that national plantation? More profits for the government, but every other cotton consuming industry is cut out from that plantation. These ideas to me constitute actually interesting interactions between private owners. I'm not sure how I feel about allowing the personality of the capitalist representative character to affect the demands and lobbying efforts. Part of me wants to do it because it would be a very cool storytelling device, but then I have to calm down and remember this game is in CK3. Not everything needs to be character driven, but you have to forgive me because I come from a Crusader Kings background. I personally would find it super cool, but I could also understand the issues with it diluting the focus of the game. I'll remain ambivalent for now. One mechanic this would interact with would be the investment pool. To me, the best way to account for the investment pool is to mostly keep things the same, but have the money invested by the five power businesses be kept in a different pool where they particularly choose their investments based on what would benefit them. Using the textile mills again, they would only invest in either the expansion of their own mill, or the expansion of cotton, silk, dyes, tools, and whatever input goods would benefit them. If the business were a steel mill, they might invest in steel consuming industries to help the price of their output good. The only problem is this would require an actually pretty smart AI who could know if their own business would benefit from an increase in input goods. If input goods are already maximally cheapened such that building more of them wouldn't help the business, then they could invest in businesses that increase demand of their outputs. And once they've maximally achieved that, the money could go into random stuff as the system is now. They could also expand their own industry if there are workers available to work. They might even try to expand even if there are no workers and just outcompete wages from every other business, until literally everyone in the state is employed by them. The ability to do this is moderated by your choices as the player around how you build the economy. If you choose to always be supporting a big business, it may very well cause the destruction of everything else in its home state due to their dominance. You can limit this by creating reasonable competition for them at the cost of them not being able to lobby you as effectively. To summarize, I want to see a system of incentives and punishments for the treatment of particularly influential businesses. It's always been unreasonable to me that the industrialists, who are composed of all the nation's capitalists, are a monolith of interests. This can be said for every interest group basically, but with respect to capitalists, it's particularly egregious. It is not in the interest of a textile mill in London to see any textile mill besides their own being expanded. I don't want an artificial label of monopoly on particular businesses. Instead, I want the monopolistic power of a particular business to be represented by the demands they make of the state and the knock-on effects of their ability to gatekeep and outcompete even unrelated industries around them. I don't want just some negative modifier like monopoly, minus 25% wages, and that modifier being the summation of the effects of a monopoly. I want the effects to be dynamic in the form of lacking employment elsewhere due to gatekeeping or the overbearing demands of a particular business. 
You might say that in the current game, there is internal competition in the form of wage competition between business in the same state. First of all, I've done extensive testing on how wages are calculated in Victoria 3, and basically no matter what the dev diaries say, I have found no demonstrable proof of wages ever being increased due to competing over labor. It could be a UI issue where it simply isn't displayed anywhere, but I've spent hours watching wage numbers simply stay stagnant while the opportunity to raise wages to steal workers from other businesses is ripe for the taking. Second of all, I would simply say, yes, you're correct. That is a form of competition between businesses, but it's a ridiculously simple compared to what could and should be in the game. Let's say that wage competition for labor did work as it should. It would still be an extremely shallow system, which does not create an interesting form of gameplay in comparison to a more interactive system that involves the player interacting with the businesses. I've got a little more to say about private ownership before I talk about what topics I'm going to cover in the next essay. I'm basically going to do one last section covering some of the potential issues that could get brought up in the comments section with regards to my proposed mechanics, and I'm going to hope to cover all the straw men that come to mind, but with that in mind, I would appreciate any ideas you guys bring up in the comments so I can further refine my ideas. So the first concern that comes to mind is the strangeness of a company being based only in one state. With the way I've put things, the size 50 textile mill from London seems to only operate in London and literally nowhere else. The way I see it, that concern is fair since it doesn't make much sense for a business to operate in literally just one place, but I'm going to put it aside to keep things from getting too complicated. Having various textile mills with different market access levels at different situations entirely would make it overly complicated. Sometimes you have to step back and remember it's a game and that it would likely be too much to have multi-state business franchises controlling the country. It's possible you can make it work, but I'm not sure how to do it in a relatively streamlined fashion. Another concern is how the UI for all this would look. In a perfect world, I'd want another tab on the left-hand side of the screen between the Market and Military tab. It would be called Oligarchs, maybe. I'm pretty bad at naming stuff, so find a better name and swap it as you see fit. But yes, a tab, and it has the five powerful businesses, their representative characters, and any requests or demands they have, as well as progress bars for how close they are to completion. In terms of how often requests and demands should come in, I think there should pretty much always be a request that can be fulfilled, and the choice to fulfill it is up to the player, but demand should only happen occasionally. This leads nicely into the next concern, which is how we measure the power of a powerful business such that it can put forward demands. To me, it should just be a raw GDP share, which I'd put around 10%. If a business manages to make up a tenth of your GDP, I'd say that is powerful enough for it to put forward demands. That's my best guess, based on obviously no testing whatsoever since this system doesn't actually exist. Weaking that GDP share number is the balancing mechanism, and it's relatively easy to do so in my opinion. Composing a large portion of the GDP isn't the only measure of power though, since while an iron mine might not compose a huge portion of the GDP, it composes a keystone of the supply chain, so it should still have power. In my opinion, that is also a fair point, but one which I'd ignore for simplicity. It might be cool to try and implement something like that, where if a particular iron miner controls a huge share of a critical resource, maybe it too could have demands, which would incentivize nationalizing resource industries as often happens in real life. For now though, I continue to concede to the power of simplicity. There could be a problem with a business shortly dipping below the 10% GDP threshold, and constantly swapping spots with the 6th place business as the GDP of each business fluctuates little with each week. I'd fix this by treating entry into the strong business category similarly to changing power level as a nation, except without the instant access to the next rank. Basically, if a business dips below the 10% GDP threshold, or the 6th place business is starting to have a higher GDP than the 5th place business, then after one year they'll change places. I believe the powerful business system could also be applied to collectivized industries, but the demands and requests they put forward would be entirely different in terms of both rewards and threats. Since this video focuses on private ownership, I'm not going to address how things would work with a cooperative business, although I think particular mechanics for co-ops would be good too. I may make a video about collective ownership, but given that most of the game is set in a capitalistic system, it makes more sense to prioritize private ownership methods. Another interesting point one could bring up would be how to differentiate publicly traded, privately owned, and merchant guild ownership methods. To be totally honest, I don't know how to differentiate it much either besides the current differences. Being able to slap on some extra capitalist jobs with publicly traded is a really unengaging usage of the concept of public trading, and the difference between a merchant guild and private enterprise is just an upgrade given that capitalist pops are more useful than shopkeepers. The last issue I'd want to fight back against preemptively would be that in Victoria 3 you play the spirit of the nation, not the government, and therefore the businesses having interest outside of your concern is not fitting to the spirit of the game. This is always an irksome argument to me. It's something of a catch-all argument to dismiss any sort of attempt at creating internal adversity in the game, but my counter to it is always the question of interest groups. If I am the spirit of the nation, can't I guide the spirit of my nation towards whatever I want? Why does it arbitrarily end at interest groups? I see no reason why interest groups should be the only section of the game which is cordoned off from the holy Victorian spirit. Sorry, I'm being a bit mean, but I just can't stand the spirit of the nation argument continuously being used to justify the game having no self-interested actors. 
Basically, I think that although the player is the spirit of the nation, it lends itself to better gameplay if the spirit is not allowed to manipulate certain things, and one of those things to me ought to be private owners and their personal interests. The rest of the issues with the system, to me, would be things to do with balance, that I'm mostly willing to let be solved by people who'd know better, although given that this mechanic isn't real, it's very difficult to come up with the balancing changes just from theory. Private ownership and its immense impact on the economic world of the Victorian era is something which ought to be further emphasized in Victoria 3 in order to make the game more interesting while still holding to the game's intention. No matter anyone's opinion on Victoria 3's direction, if the game wants to move in the economic, diplomatic, and political sector, leaving war behind, then it should do that in earnest. For the time being, the economic mechanics of Victoria 3 are complex for complexity's sake and ultimately much of them are obtuse and flavorless. The differences between cooperative ownership, government ownership, and private ownership are mostly meaningless, and that should be amended. I proposed a couple changes to particularly private ownership, which I believe would fix the issues to enough of an extent to make the game much more interesting. By shifting away from the rigid economic law system and allowing more flexible ownership assignments, the relationship between the state and the private capitalist becomes more complicated, and decisions around how to divide up the enterprises of the country shape not just the economic makeup of the country, but also the mentality of individuals within it. By creating systems which allow for competition within a market, the often cutthroat monopoly business practices emblematic of the unfettered capitalism of the 19th and 20th centuries can create both challenges and stories that provide immense value to the game. For the time being, every country plays the same, no matter how they are played, but with these systems, every country could have a unique set of industries running things under the hood which shape the way their nation develops organically. Journal entries are an inferior solution to dynamic mechanics that drive forward change without railroading. Finally, there are certain recognizable flaws with my ideas that I've tried to address preemptively. If you feel I've missed anything, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to address it there at least. Thanks for watching and hope you enjoyed the essay. The next one is going to cover another aspect of Victoria 3 I feel needs improving. Laws and politics. Without spoiling too much, I think laws are an extremely important part of shaping a country, and the current law system often feels obtuse and strange. Why can't a king without a constitution simply decree that a law should pass? Why can't a republic with a contested government pass a law only 10% of the population wants just due to a random chance rule? These sorts of issues and their solutions will be discussed on the next essay. As one last aside before the end of the video, I want to ask what you guys think of this sort of episodic structure for these essays. Where normally I'd release one large video of several hours length as I did for CK3, Victoria 3, and EU4, I would instead try releasing these more manageable chunks of writing that can be digested with more of a focus on a particular issue, and then afterwards stringing along these essays into one summary video. Let me know your opinions below. Thank you for your time.